Chevy Chase would be the worst. Number It'd be one, a joke, right? Oh, it would be. A, yeah. Can you think of the amount of CGI like, budget that would go to bullshit. like making his hairline look better in those young scenes? No, it's bullshit. It's bullshit. You're hearing all these movies that he was up for because he's having some rep put that shit out there. <laughs> Nobody was considering Chevy. Ch- I'll bet my life on it. Chevy right. Chase was not up for this fucking movie. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but they were sweet when they killed Ellis. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, with the movies we love and growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you even remember what Blockbuster Video was? Have you answered yes, and this is the podcast for you? I'm one of your three co-hosts, Roger Roper, and alongside me are my two co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And our very special co-host of uh, Real Spoilers, you can catch him there weekly, uh, Nice Guy of the he's like the tom hanks if you will a <laughs> podcast is. kevin brackett oh well um, it's been a while since we've talked on the air so i don't know we'll have to see if that still rings true but thank you so <laughs> much raj it's great to be back we take it a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up each week the audience selects from six movie choices that we then break out a race car vhs tape rewinders and watch the movie that tallied the highest number of votes at the end of the podcast the three of us will provide you the audience with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts so thank you so much for listening. If you have not already hit that subscribe button and share with a friend, it's how we help the podcast grow. Or you can check out our sister podcast chat on TV, where we review television series such as Westworld taboo, American gods, game of Thrones, true detective and Watchmen. find all the information or past episodes at chat on TV.com. And finally, for everyone who craves all of our chat, follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel. Just go to chat, the movies.com forward slash Twitch, where you can catch both past and live content every week and if you have any thoughts on today's review or any past reviews if you agree or you disagree with us or maybe you have an experience you'd like to share with us you can email us your thoughts your experiences at hosts at chat or leave us a voicemail at 914-719-SHAT just make sure to put the uh, word dropbox in the title of your email or your voicemail Big D, people uh, are still sending in commissions throughout the entire pandemic. People have uh, taken their their hard-earned stimulus money, and we are booked solid through, I think, April of next year, which I, I still find incredibly fascinating. Uh, so with that being said, what, what movie are have we been commissioned to do today? Well, uh, besides being very, very honored that our, our listeners choose to support us so generously, uh, they've been also very kind. They're supporting lately really good movies, which makes the podcast even easier to do. So one of our listeners, Joshua R., said, I would love for you guys to do a movie which seems to be universally loved, but at the same time, people think it didn't deserve all the awards that it got. And it is the 1994 Academy Awards juggernaut, Forrest Gump. Yeah, and anytime we get in a commission request, we always ask the individual to send in an email or a voicemail with their thoughts on the movie or why they sent in their money to shat the movies.com, which by the way, if you have a commission, if you want to hop the front of the line, just go to shat the movies.com forward slash support. But Joshua R writes in greetings. Once again, shacking recently, my wife gave birth to our second beautiful daughter, Eliza. And as a parent, the birth of a child causes you to wonder what their firsts and favorites will be in life. Often leading you to reminisce on your own movies being a staple for my early days. I pondered once again, my own ever changing list of personal favorites. And while my current top two movies are Inception and 1917 are well past your time window for what you do here at Chat the Movies, 1994's Forrest Gump is noticeably lacking in the pantheon of Chat. Now, I first saw Forrest Gump while on vacation in the summer it was released with my family. A 13-year-old kid at the time, the humor I got, but not having experienced much real life at that point, a great deal of the emotionality was lost on me. On first viewing, I thought it a decent movie, but I couldn't understand why my parents had been noticeably crying when we left the theater. Over the ensuing years and countless subsequent viewings, I came to understand and appreciate with a much greater conviction the true greatness and humanity of the movie. Tom Hanks is absolutely outstanding in his role as Forrest. It's hard to imagine that he could follow up his Oscar-winning performance in 1993's Philadelphia with an equally, if not better, Oscar-winning performance the very next year, but that's exactly what happened. The surrounding cast is superb, 
The cinematography at times is breathtaking and the soundtrack top notch. Play the theme song's opening bars on a piano, and I'd be willing to bet the majority of Shat listeners would recognize it instantly. If I have one complaint about the film, though, it does seem to drag a little with age. Still, watching Forrest Gump gives us viewers a comedic, at times heartbreaking, but overall magical journey th- across the decades. Few movies have the ability to bring me to tears, but soon to be staring down 40 and now having experienced the births of my own children, deaths of loved ones, and just life in general, Forrest Gump keeps tugging at those heartstrings upon every viewing. It's in my own personal top five movies of all time, and probably between a half a wipe or a one wipe on my own chat meter, and I can't wait to hear your review. And as always, keep up the good work, Joshua. I guess, Joshua, you made it hard on me, okay? Normally, people write in their their memories and their feelings about the movie, and we can just be objective. He could, he'd make it damn hard to shit on this movie the way he loves it. But I'm, I still have to do it somewhat, Joshua, so don't hate me. Well, it's interesting because we're, as we're recording this, um, we're going to be releasing this a few days after, but it's Father's Day. And, and the two of you are both fathers. Kevin, you just celebrated the birth of your second child, and Big D... Young Jenny looks strikingly like Emma. It, it, she's thankfully having a very different upbringing. <laughs> but I do agree. I think watching this movie for the first time as a parent, certain sections of the film did have an emotional impact that had not had before. Well, Forrest Gump is a 1994 American comedy drama film directed by Robert Zemeckis and written by Eric Roth. It is based on the 1986 novel of the same name by Winston Groom and stars Tom Hanks, Robin Wright, Gary Sinise, McKelty Williamson, and Sally Field. The story depicts several decades in the life of Forrest Gump, a slow-witted but kind-hearted man from Alabama who witnesses and unwittingly influences several defining historical events in the 20th century United States. The film differs substantially from the novel. Forrest Gump was released in the United States on July 6th, 1994 and received favorable reviews for Zemeckis' directing, Sinise and Hanks' performances, the visual effects, the music, and the screenplay. The film was an enormous success at the box office with a budget of just $55 million. It became the top grossing film in America released that year and earned over $677 million worldwide during its theatrical run, making it globally the second highest grossing film of that year behind the lion king and the soundtrack get this guy sold over 12 million copies forrest gump went on to win the academy awards for best picture best director best actor best adapted screenplay best visual effects and best film editing it received many award nominations including golden globes british academy film awards and the screen actors guild awards before we dive into the review of this movie and break down the plot give you our opinion of it we always ask a question where were you what are your memories of this movie we'll start with you kevin you're our guest here what what are your thoughts of forrest gump or when was the first time you watched forrest gump so i've loved this movie as long as i can remember and i don't i don't have a specific memory of the first time i saw it i just know i've always loved it right like i know for sure i saw it on vhs i didn't see it in the theater i would have been pretty young at the time of release but uh i'm pretty positive we rented it from the grocery store that's when groceries first of all video stores existed second of all grocery stores had them oftentimes in them which is crazy to think of now with them not existing almost anywhere but uh my my mom showed me the movie she knew it was a great film and i watched it uh and i loved it even though of course being young i mean i probably was the first time i saw it i was maybe 10 i i would think uh somewhere around there so of course i didn't understand a lot of it but it's interesting that i still enjoyed it without knowing everything that was actually going on there's enough there to be an enjoyable movie um but you know of course watching it as an adult and especially recently you pick up on so much more you know whether it's the double entendre or the the references to historical events and like big d said uh even the you know being a father it hits you differently uh this is the modern equivalent of a tall tale this is uh you know a story that this guy's life is larger than life and uh, big fish does a similar thing so i'm thinking that this movie helped that along uh but if people haven't seen big fish that's another one i can't recommend highly enough what about you big d had you ever seen forrest gump so there's only a handful of times in my life that I can remember my entire family going to the movies. One was the Godfather part three. It was right around Christmas. Uh, I, I star Wars also in the back of the station wagon. Uh, but I do remember going to see Forrest Gump. It was the 4th of July weekend, 1994. Uh, so we got in the car, went down. We all loved it. 
And you got to remember, this is the time before the internet. You, there was no streaming bootlegs. You would have to go into New York City to get a bad VHS copy. But working at Blockbuster, I was lucky enough to have a coworker who was related to an Academy voter. So the, the Academy Awards, they used to send out screener copies of the tape. Now they do digitally, and you'll see a bunch of them on you know, pirate sites. So I actually got copies of all the 1994 nominated films. There was Forrest Gump. Four Weddings and a Funeral, Pulp Fiction, Quiz Show, and The Shawshank Redemption. Besides feeling like, hey, I'm on the inside. At college, everyone (laughs) wanted to see these movies. I was like the coolest person, even though it's pathetic now to say, but uh, it was nice. It was good to see all these movies uh, at home and be able to to, to hook up other people. But uh, That's like me with CD burners, Big D. I was yeah. the first one in my entire class that had a CD burner and people were asking me to make mix CDs, you know, and like girls wanted them. And I'm like, yeah, you give me your list, right? And I was, it, it's crazy to think that people couldn't burn a CD or that would be like now not knowing how to download an MP3. And, uh, you know, it's weird to say things like that. But when you're at the head of those technologies, it's you become popular. Did did you ever barter them for sex? <laughs> no. I, oh, I neither, was, did I. Ne- neither did I. Neither did I. <laughs> no. <laughs> this movie lasted in the in the box office 42 weeks. Wow. Which is almost yeah. unheard of. 42 weeks. You could go to the your local theater and watch this movie. Um I I've, I've talked about this before in the summers I would spend with my father. It's Father's Day, so I'm a little bit emotional and all that kind of stuff. But I remember going to the theater with my first stepmom because summers were spent with dad. But dad was working, so my my stepmom and I went and watched this. And like Joshua R., I looked over at her, and she just waterworks, just crying. And I think I was – I'm three years older than you, Kevin, so I, I was 13 at the time. I'm the same age as Joshua R. Uh, I remember really liking it. I thought the humor was great. I was a big Tom Hanks fan, but – a lot of the references, because I was so young, I didn't get right. I was I liked history, so I knew a lot of the historical stuff. But I remember loving it so much that I went back that summer and watched, uh, or I rented the the book from the library. I checked it out, and like I said up front, the book is completely different. Like it's a completely never read different it. character. Yeah, it is. Uh, if you've ever read it, you're like this. N- n- the book doesn't even reference any of the shit that happens in the movie. It's so vastly different. Um, He's kind of an asshole. Like it's, he's closer to sling blade. He's closer to that kind of character. um, If you will, he's, he's even worse. Like he's kind of a jerk. He curses a lot. He talks about like, like having sex with Jenny a lot. It's really, yeah, it's not great. Isn't so, that strange I when a movie, it. usually people that read the books get disappointed by the movie, and then yeah. here they optioned this book, they made this movie, they knew it was going to be a big deal, and the movie's so good, it's just, it seems almost the opposite of what usually happens. Yeah, but it's smart. You're not going to take the family to see me, a movie where Forrest like, fuck you. <laughs> Mama <laughs> yeah. said you're going to get fucked up in life. Mama <laughs> said life sucks. No, yeah, you're true. not going to take the family to see that movie. <laughs> right. Or if Forrest Gump murders someone with a sling blade. <laughs> yeah, I'd go see that. <laughs> Definitely. With that being said, Big D, play the trailer. Hello, my name's Forrest, Forrest Gump. Would you like a chocolate? Oh, thank you. It's funny what a young man recollects. You're the same as everybody else. You are no different. Your boy's different. Are you stupid or something? Mama says stupid as a stupid does. I'm Jenny. I'm Boris Forrest She was my most special friend. My only friend. We was together all the time. We were like peas and carrots, Jenny and I. Run, Forrest! Hey, stupid! Run! Now, you wouldn't believe it if I told you, but I can run like the wind blows. Who in the hell is that? And there's Forrest Gump, coach. Just a local idiot. I never thought it would take me anywhere. They even put me on a thing called the All-America Team. Well, you get to meet the President of the United States. Congratulations. How does it feel to be an All-American? I got a pay. <laughs> I believe he said he had to go pee. <laughs> now, maybe it's just me, but college was very confusing times. Have you ever been with a girl, Forrest? I sit next to them in my home economics class all the time. Have you given any thought to your future? Go! What's your sole purpose in this army? To 
do whatever you tell me, drill sergeant. You're a damn genius. You are going to be a general someday, go. Yes, drill sergeant! They sent me to Vietnam. Listen, you promise me something, okay? If you're ever in trouble, don't try to be brave. You just run, okay? Okay. Where are you boys from in the world? Alabama, sir. You twins? No, we are not relations, sir. For some reason, what I was doing seemed to make sense to people. Forget about me! Get yourself out! I've been awarded the Medal of Honor. How come? Now, my mama's always tell me how miracles happen every day. <laughs> some people don't think so. Jenny! But they do. You can come home with me at my house in Greenbow. I'll take care of you. Why are you so good to me? You're my girl. Paramount Pictures presents Tom Hanks. I'm not a smart man, but I know what love is. Robin Wright. Will you marry me? I'd make a good husband, Jenny. You would, Forrest. But you won't marry me. Gary Sinise. I never thanked you for saving my life. And Sally Field. My boy Forrest is going to get the same opportunities as everyone else. A film by Robert Zemeckis. What's my destiny, Mom? You're going to have to figure that out for yourself. never seem the same once you've seen it through the eyes of Forrest Gump. My mom always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. In 1981, a white feather drifts out of the sky and lands at a bus stop in Savannah, Georgia. A man named Forrest Gump picks it up and places it in his copy of the children's book, Curious George. He then recounts his life story to strangers who sit next to him on a bench. He recalls on the first day of school, he meets a girl named Jenny, whose life is followed in parallel to Forrest's at times. And having discarded his leg braces that he grows up with, his ability to run at lightning speed gets him into college at the University of Alabama on a football scholarship. So like many movies, you know, there's a lot of time has passed since the last time I saw it. So the movie starts up. I'm watching it with fresh eyes. And I found myself wanting to to make fun of Forrest. He, he's sitting at a bus stop. He's offering candy to strangers if they'll sit and listen to his story. It's <laughs> creepy. He is the guy that every parent tells you to stay away from. He's sitting there with his khakis, his pressed outfit. He's got a gift in his hands. And, and I really want to make fun of him. And then Tom Hanks starts to really kick in the charm. And I found that his innocence... And the way, I mean, for, for God's sake, he's Mr. Rogers. You know, he's the only man mm -hmm. who can do it. His performance and his ability takes a verbal cadence that would be comical. You would make fun of him today. Mm -hmm. Disarms you, and it allowed me to kick back and accept a ridiculous premise for a movie, and it is all on Tom Hanks' shoulders. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that, Big D, because do you know the three actors that were up for this role before they turned it down and Tom Hanks came on board? They are... Get this, the number one pick, John Travolta. Can you imagine John Travolta sitting at the bus stop offering candy to people? I don't know. Uh, I mean, he was popular, but that seems weird to me. Uh, next up, they went to Bill Murray. Now, Bill Murray is, I mean, he's a comedic genius. We all love Bill Murray, but I don't know that you could be as empathetic with Bill Murray. He's such a smug guy. I mean, that's his thing. He's a he's a he's a dick but a lovable dick right and so it seems all wrong and uh then kind of in the same category i guess they couldn't get bill murray they went to chevy chase i mean again you know great comedian big guy at the time but that doesn't work for for this character it, like you said big d there's nobody else i can imagine i know that it's hard you know to put yourself in that position we've grown up we know this movie and tom hanks but i can't imagine it any other way especially not with those three guys chevy chase's name keeps coming up and you're like, was he really that popular? He was that, po back he was that popular. Yeah. That's yeah. It just offering him everything. Him. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, um, a couple others that I read that were also offered the role or were on the short list was Bill Paxton. That's In fact, close. he was um, one of Zemeckis' initial first choices for Forrest Gump. And I could kind of see that, but the studio demanded somebody with more star power, which is cool. And then um, we talked about the the author of the book. Well, in the book, Forrest is described as being six foot six tall. So he's like big D size and he weighs around 240 pounds, which is why Winston Groom wanted John Goodman. He said uh, he said in, in interviews that he's always imagined John Goodman as this character. But we discussed on Sling Blade, our Sling Blade review, how there were a string of movies around this time that called for actors to play mentally challenged characters and how in the hands of the wrong actor, it would be terrible. Chevy Chase would be the worst. Number one. It'd be one, a joke, right? Oh, it would be. A, <laughs> yeah. Can you think of the amount of CGI like, budget that would go to bullshit. like making his hairline look better in those young scenes? No, it's bullshit. It's bullshit. You're hearing all these movies that he was up for because he's having some rep put that shit out there. <laughs> Nobody was considering Chevy. Ch- I'll bet my life on it. Chevy right. Chase was not up for this fucking movie. So don't buy that bullshit, please. That's Chevy fucking being Chevy. <laughs> well, I would like. I, I would know, like I to believe right that. Here. It, yeah. it says right here, Chevy Chase says he was up for the role, Big D. I don't. I'm going to write it down right now. Chevy Chase was not up for this role. Yep, I read it somewhere. Uh, well, what's interesting is you talk about John Travolta. And around this time, John Travolta had just uh, made Pulp Fiction, right? Or it just because I think 94 was Pulp Fiction. If up I'm, against if it. Not. He was. I mean, yeah. uh, there were. That's the thing is that this movie, there were some great movies in 94. And one of the best, I think, is Pulp Fiction. So there was tough competition. Yeah. But we got to see John Travolta play like two years later. He got to play kind of a mentally challenged person. Remember the movie oh, Phenomenon? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Where, he's, yeah. where he's the every man and then he be, he gets like a tumor in his brain or something like that. And then he can like lift objects. Is that but based the on the Homer, the Cran episode of the season? Yeah, you're right. That- <laughs> exactly. The worst though. Have you seen this? It came out last year. Uh, the Fanatic. Oh my God. Raj, I. Written and directed by Fred Durst of Limp Biscuit. I where I I he plays love a this mentally movie because it's it's so bad. But Raj, I love it. I watched it because I'm like, this is insane. Like Fred Fred Durst has been out making Russian propaganda videos. Like that's what he's been doing with his really? time. Doing doing like retours of Limp Bizkit, like you know, comeback things or whatever, and seriously making Russian propaganda videos. Uh and so like when I heard he written wrote and direct this movie starring John Travolta, who you know Travolta will make any movie that you ask him right. to make at this point. It is so bonkers and the performance is just batshit crazy. I honestly would recommend it because it's so terrible and fun to watch. It's it's worse than Ben Siller's Simple Jack in the beginning of <laughs> Tropic Thunder, Big D. Like you got it, you've got to at least just see a couple clips of John Travolta trying to play a mentally challenged man. He the Forrest Gump wouldn't have worked. It, it just it would have been bad. No, it would have been Forrest sitting on the bench handing out Scientology fucking you know, <laughs> oh notebooks God. and giving readings. That's what the movie would have been. But they did get the cast right. Yeah, They didn't pick any of these, including Chevy Chase, but they did get Sally Field. And I, how, you had 13 nominations for this movie. How did she not get one? How many others that didn't even deserve it? She is everything that a movie mother should be. She's caring. She's instilling a sense of self-worth in young Forrest. Forrest, you're the same as everyone else. You know, and I got to tell you, as a parent, I got to respect a mother who is willing to do anything for her child, even if that means having sex with the school principal to guarantee a better education. I didn't pick up on that as a kid. Yeah. I got to say, if I was in a situation where I couldn't provide... I would have sex with that principal to guarantee he gets into a better school. One of my one of my favorite bits that I do is just the <laughs> that for the young force makes like again. Oh, that's a bit. I didn't know that was a bit. Yeah, that, no, but like I, I always like to pretend because I don't like to like I'm not sexy in bed. You know what I mean? Like when oh, I'm yeah. when I'm having adult time. So I always <laughs> always make that joke when I'm with a lucky I, lucky lady. But uh, if I remember correctly, uh, this reignited <laughs> Sally wait, Field's on. career. I found myself wondering. Yo, Mrs. Gump, she was rocking this dude's world. What was right. she doing? That, that house this was d- like rumbling. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Go, Miss well, Gump. But I mean, you know, we and Raj were what as kids, like that scene, I don't 
Mm-hmm. You had no idea what was happening as a kid, no. like, but for some reason it was still entertaining, I think, because he's making noises and you're like, that's silly, but right. What really makes this movie, and it's not the historical events, it's not the CGI, it really is the Zemeckis' directing. I love when a movie tells you what year you're in or the emotions of a character through visual cues versus exposition or putting the location and, uh, you know, like they could have um, in the New Year's Eve scene, they could have put New Year's Eve 1975, you know, or you know, something like that versus showing you on the television, the bicentennial fireworks that were happening at the time or being in New York City or the suitcase that he opens. It has all of his adventures that he's yeah. about to discuss. And you you notice we know it's 1981 because there's an ad on the bus. For, a, for a, the 1981 model of a vehicle and through great visual storytelling without expressively telling us all of that, I just think it means so much more. Also, um, the meeting of the different presidents, Elvis, all of that, again, tells you what era you're in alongside the music. It's just an extremely well-crafted movie. It's smart. I mean, that's uh, one of my pet peeves is lazy exposition. So I'm I'm with you, Raj. When a movie can tell you what's going on without feeding it to you through some, because one of the worst things in movies, and I'm sure, I mean, we've all talked about it before. When when a character talks to another character and explains something to them like they're a child, but it's their expertise or it's the mission that they're on, they're not going to be talking about these specifics. Like they're not going to say or like, oh hey, I you know I'm glad it's 1981. I mean, no one talks like that. And right. this movie is masterful in the way it's crafted you're right but like as a kid did the historical events did they go over your head or did you kind of know what they were at the time they were lost on me i mean i'll fully admit it because i was i was so young i didn't understand all of this yet but i still it's the movie still worked right because you know he's getting older you see there's a different president uh you uh you can just tell by things going on so even though i couldn't follow the exact year i think the movie is again so crafted so well that you still get that time is passing and he's on to this different chapter he they say uh when he's playing football which i'm not trying to jump ahead too far but they say like oh it's been five years right like they tell you Mm -hmm. that so you can put together there's five years later and then he serves in the army and then his time is up so they do things like that where you don't really necessarily have to know the year but as an adult those historical events add context and it just adds another level to appreciate okay i i enjoy the storytelling (laughs) i enjoy the use of the historical moments but you can't deny this they're manipulating people's emotions this is we didn't start the fire with billy joel you know, Harry Truman, Doris Day, he's running through history. They're overlaying music that everyone knows. So even if you didn't grow up in the time, you're getting the vibe. You're feeling it. And it's it's cute. I, I do enjoy it. But they do go to the well one or two times too much for me. I understand it is this fantastic story about, you know, all the things that Forrest had done. But things you, you didn't need the John Lennon. You didn't need everybody, every president getting shot. I would have rather had them remove two or three. And I love, I love the big ones. They're cute. But for me, like Forrest stumbling out during the uh, the integration of the high schools in Alabama, and he's in the background, like behind Wallace, and he's like waving. And the coaches are watching it on TV. Like that's that's not Forrest, is it? And then Forrest comes out of the shower, showing us some Tom Hanks, you know, full blown bush pubic hair, in the sh- which shocked me. Those are the moments that are quick and passing that they don't dwell on too much. Like I gotta go pee. That's a great line. That's great. Yeah, that actually is a callback to the book. In the book, he runs for Senate, and his catchphrase is "I gotta pee" because he said it. But, you know, I, I, but to your point, like, I understand, I mean, if it's not your thing, then it definitely gets excessive because they do it a lot. But that's what I love about this movie. It is, again, a tall tale. They, this character is larger than life, Forrest Gump. The fact that he was alive during all these events and somehow played a part in them, either in the backdrop or he directly affected them. That's what I love about the movie. Like that makes it for me. And I, I just think it's fun. And also Forrest is recounting his story. You have to remember, um, it's great that you see all the stuff in the suitcase and then towards the end when you you know you see a forbes ma- fortune or whatever so like you know he's telling the truth mm-hmm. but it didn't happen exactly like that i think that's the part that's fun to think about that you know that's how forrest tells the story the one thing that uh, i agree with you big d the john lennon captain kangaroo 
that was uh, a little shoehorn for me. But get, get this: there was one scene that was left on the cutting room floor because I and I think it, it was done. I'm glad it was left out. There was a scene where he's in Alabama going to visit Jenny, and they and they see a big group of individuals marching, uh, <laughs> protesting for civil rights, and it was Shut Martin up. Luther King. Swear Shut to God. Up. Swear to God, they filmed it and they were like, mm, maybe this is a little bit, maybe people are going to take this in the wrong way. But yeah, that was one thing that was left on the cutting room floor, which I agree with. Um, I wish that John Lennon would have been uh, left because I find the the plot of Forrest's life, like his interactions with Lieutenant Dan, Bubba, Jenny, that's more interesting to me than what people typically remember of this movie, which is all those scenes with all the presidents. But again, I do like the fact that he's like, so I went, you know, to visit the president again at the white house again, you know, like it's just so blase to him. Cause he's done this over and over again, you know, because that's just who he is. But people on Twitter agree with you, big D people who are not fans of this movie think it's saccharine sweet. And I could see your argument. And ultimately the movie though, for me, in my opinion, it takes you through a wide range of emotions. I found myself laughing, crying, cheering at times. And maybe it's because we've come too cynical, right? In this post 9-11 world. Uh, but this is, I think, what movies should make you do. I think this is the whole reason people went to the movies. The leg braces breaking scene. I was on a plane coming back from Florida last night. I was crying. Because I was so excited. You could feel the young, the, the actor who plays for young Forrest. like the music is so good. Alan Silvestri, who's partnered with, you know, Bob Zemeckis uh, multiple times. Like I'm back to the future. It's so good. Um, the sound the principal makes, we talked about it. Huge laugh, the football scenes when he says, can you believe after only five years of playing football? Like, again, not only does it tell you where we are in the timeline, but it's just a great line. And also, I did like the the Back to the Future scene. Do you guys, do you guys catch that? I don't think I caught it. What was it? When back when when he catches Jenny in the car, that's like oh, that's like Back to the Future true. when he opens punching up, punching out Biff, yeah, right. He's punching out Biff. So I thought that was a cute call back to Back to the Future that I didn't catch the first couple of times. So guys, I don't mind a movie that is going to manipulate my emotions. I expect that from a movie. I go to a puppet show. I don't want to see the strings. Just show me the puppet. When I can spot what they're doing, I'm like, okay, here we go. This is what they're doing. This is what they're... It doesn't mean that the movie had less of an effect on me. Roger, you're correct. When young Forrest has that realization that his braces break off and he looks down and looks up and smiles, I get goosebumps. I get them right now. So I'm just saying that the movie is, is perfection in so many areas, but also in some others, I don't want to see how the sausage is made. I think. I think what this movie does that I really loved is all those things you guys said, I agree with it's movies used to be made to make you feel good. I think we forget that in this day and age with so much negativity, movies have to be dark. Superhero movies all have to be dark, even Superman, which makes no sense. Like we've been trained that good movies are not happy are not bright. They have to have all this struggle and, you can do those things as we've seen in this movie. Forrest has plenty of adversity, but he also was a feel good movie. And you go to the theater or you used to go to the theater and you cheer and you'd feel all these big moments. And this is, I think, considered a classic because it gave you that feeling that people used to go to the theater for. Uh, it ranks number 71 on the American Film Institute's top 100 movies of all time. You know, it's up there with all the greats. And I just can't help but to feel that this is something that we've lost uh, don't get me wrong there's plenty of great movies i mean we all love movies and there's plenty of good ones that come out but you know how you feel old saying this but they don't make them like they used to it was a different era and this movie reminded me of what what they used to do yeah the biggest knock on it now is that you know gen xers or uh, millennials will say well, this is a whitewashed exploration of American history for boomers. Like it's a nostalgia trip for boomers. This is the history of America that they want to remember. And I would, I, I argue that it's less about that than it is about the story of this man that is going through adversity in his life and how he responds to that adversity and how he changes those around him. That to me, the crux of that on top of it, just being just, again, a well-crafted movie is I think the strength of this of Forrest Gump personally. 
So, I mean, I get why people say that, but again, I, like you said, I think people were just too fucking cynical these days. So I think you can have both ways. You can, uh, you know, you can objectively agree with that sentiment and still say this movie is good. Well, after his college graduation, he enlists in the army and is sent to Vietnam where he makes fast friends with a black man named Bubba who convinces Forrest to go into the shrimping business with him when the war is over. Later, while on patrol, Forrest's platoon is attacked, and though Forrest rescues many of them, Bubba is killed in action. Forrest is then awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for his heroism. So it's been a few years since I've seen this, and I misremember when Forrest goes to see Jenny at college. I would have bet my life that she jerks him off without a doubt. I would, when, when she takes him up to his, to her, to her dorm room, which is women's only, no wonder Jenny gets in trouble and kicked out later. Uh, and Forrest climaxes and he, he says the famous line. I think I ruined your roommate's bathrobe to the sleeping roommate. Who's now wakes horror. So, good. so, so Jenny throughout the beginning of the movie, she's made it. Uh, you know, really clear that she thinks that the forest is not a fully functioning adult. He is, he is not able to make adult rational decisions that he is. He, he's more than slow witted. So for the fact that she exposes her breast, puts his hand on it, manipulates floor forest. Does that make this sexual contact inappropriate? Because if they were reversed, if Forrest, the football star jock at Alabama, had brought a slow, dim-witted girl into his dorm room and put her hand down his pants, would we be like, <laughs> that's so cute? I don't think you could do either of them today in 2020. It's it, it was a different time. I also have to say, too, though, Big D, I know what you mean. I Again, I don't think today you would do either, but... I, does, does this man who's slow witted not deserve to have relationships or, you know, I was thinking about this, especially later on in the movie as the relationship changes and evolves. Um, you know, he's slow, but he also takes care of himself. He's perfectly capable and, you know, he deserves happiness too. So yeah. I, I don't, I don't think, I think it would be conceived that way, but I don't think it necessarily is that way. Just to be double sure. And we're going to check all the boxes you have to verbalize that to Forrest. Only at the end of the movie does Forrest say, I know what love is. At this point, we don't know if Forrest knows what love is. Jenny should have said, Forrest, have you ever? Did she? Oh, she did say, have she you does. ever been with a lady? She says, yeah, she says that. Eh, she says, have uh, you ever been with a, a woman I don't before? Care. I mean, I still it's, doesn't make it right. He's lying. I don't, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's done from, it's not done in a predator predatory manner you can you know that they have been friends since childhood it would make sense that later on in life obviously they never broached the subject this is where she broaches the subject and it's not like he's saying no or, or he feels you know because i think he does love jenny at this point obviously he just punched out the dude back to the future style i think he's car. always loved jenny yeah and he always no yeah, doubt so he would have been with her since they were old enough to, you know, if they could get yeah. married at 15 or something, he would have. And it, it, um, you also have to remember, too, not to go too deep into it, but Jenny was sexually abused. Like, so a lot of her actions on the surface, you may be like, oh, why is Jenny so terrible? Because she keeps mistreating Forrest and Forrest just loves her and she keeps running away. But this is a very troubled person that's dealt with a lot of shit and uh it's it's terrible what she went through but she also probably well we know based on what we've seen in the movie sex to her isn't like a big deal she's not like oh i'm gonna take his virginity and it's gonna be special she's just like i i love forrest and whatever that means as a friend or we've grown up together and she is very familiar with sex and all that and so she's not thinking of it like it's a big deal i don't think well, don't victims of abuse, especially sexual abuse, and again, I, I, I don't know. Don't they, don't they show that? Isn't this their way of showing something that they love? Because this is the way that they were taught to love. Yeah, I could see it, and, and it doesn't make it right on a, some kind of technical level. And again, not condoning or saying that today it would be okay. But I, I agree that it's not done from a predatory standpoint. And as weird as it would feel with a modern sensibility, right? I do feel that these two love each other, and it may not have always lined up. But I think I think it's easy to <laughs> tell. Just, that they, just, yeah, you, I love the way you guys are just dancing around the law. <laughs> Explain it away. They're friends. They respect <laughs> each other. We're going to use that next time, right? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They well, were friends. Well, one of the best parts of this movie is when he enlists in the army. And 
again, it still gets a chuckle out of me today. The scene with the drill sergeant. Hell yes. Fucking phenomenal. I oh. didn't laugh harder in this movie than this scene. I love it. It is so hilarious because, I mean, Forrest Gump, I mean, he's definitely on the spectrum. Is that what we would say? I mean, oh, yeah. as far as, he, you know, he has his, he's almost like Rain Man in a sense, like in, in that mm-hmm. he's very matter of fact. And so the fact that like the army is actually really good for him because he does what he's told, he gets it. And I mean, the fact that the drill sergeant loves him because he just says exactly what he's supposed yes. to do. Fuck super soldiers, fuck universal <laughs> soldier, all kind of enhancements. You know, we don't need that shit. If you had 2 million Forrest Gumps, oh my you gosh. could take over the world. He, he just takes things literally. Yeah. He does what he's told. He immediately reacts. He's got a hell of a right hand. He'll just knock anybody out. Oh, he, so good. He, he can fireman carry dudes to rescue. He rescued his he, whole platoon. <laughs> five dudes and and you know bubba ain't too slim so bubba was a that was a good haul yeah. so force is the dream soldier and the, the drill sergeant's response is god damn it gump you you're a genius a genius I, that that shit's one i loved it best that's one of the best that is the, the most movie. outstanding answer i've ever heard yeah you oh. are a goddamn genius you have an iq of 150 but you, you are know, gonna best- be a, you are gonna be a general <laughs> I'm not going to go backtrack and get into it too much, but this is, as you rewatch it, you have to admit, one of the most quotable movies. I mean, for everything from Mama always says life was like a box of chocolates to the run for us run. Uh, it, it, there's just tons of them. And, and this is another one. These are the shrimp, the shrimp lines. I mean, who hasn't throughout their life been like, you know, you can make shrimp scampi and sh- fry them. And it, this movie is full of those cultural moments that people repeat and is ultra quotable. Did you know the My Name's Forrest Gump, People Call Me Forrest Gump? That was ad-libbed by Tom Hanks. I read that, and it's amazing. It's I, I did laugh during that one, too, though, when it's like, yeah, man, you know, my name is whatever. They call me Bubba, and, and you know, uh, mm-hmm. my name's Forrest Gump. They call me Forrest Gump. He's so literal. <laughs> it's great. The the responses to the drill subject you like are classic. It's, I think it's on par with Full Metal Jacket, um, disassembling the rifle. So he, I don't like... Again, looking back now and knowing what we know now, because research has come a long way since 1994, he isn't slow. I do believe that he's more on the autistic spectrum. In fact, two Japanese doctors went down that path, perhaps kind of tongue in cheek, but they made an official diagnosis of Forrest Gump, according to the DSM for autistic disorder criteria, ruling out possible alternative diagnoses such as Rett's disorder or childhood uh, disingrate, um, disin integrative disorder um, according to the observational evidence that we see on film here so it is he is more along the lines of that than slow-witted which yeah makes sense which, to me and i think especially i think in this day and age it may be more offensive to say that someone can't have sex with him uh, someone that's autistic right. because it's that doesn't the law kevin <laughs> it's the law i think he's of age at this point yeah, yeah he's if, 23 if he's... He's of age. He's autistic. He functions on a different level, but I still don't right. think it's taking advantage of. So I'm just saying you better be careful because you yes. might be more offensive saying that. I'm that's... not being offensive. <laughs> what? what that, I resp- that I respect someone's <laughs> that someone's body that I would say, make sure you're aware of what the, a person's capability is, whether but or not you they think, can give consent. Do you think Forrest, do you think Forrest is being taken advantage of, though? I'm not a doctor or a police officer. I'm only Guys, posing the, the question. Book. And if you're offended by this, just read yeah. the 86 book because he goes into great lengths about how he and Jenny have sex everywhere. Oh. Uh, so this is far more innocent. But uh, back to Vietnam, you know, Apocalypse Now is one of the movies that I remember with Riot of the Valkyries. But when Credence Clearwater, when CCR comes over and, you know, they're riding in, oh, again, gives me chills. The soundtrack is phenomenal in this movie. It feels almost as iconic as that, Raj. I mean, you're right. I mean, that's the one that you always think of with Vietnam. But when I heard this, the 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 uh, the feelings you get hearing all this great music, it is amazing. I mean, I'm like, how much did this soundtrack cost? Because it is hit after hit after hit. And I'm glad you mentioned the numbers because I didn't look them up. But when you said how many it sold, did you say 12 million? 12 million 12 yeah. million it's not surprising at all because this is huge it's a two disc soundtrack and they go through these hits of the time period and stuff from elvis uh to all these great songs from the 60s uh, that happened during the vietnam and and uh, the doors uh, it is just phenomenal and um i'm like i want to go buy this soundtrack that was my first thought I, I know kids today don't know what infomercials are. I had this soundtrack i know you had this soundtrack but do you remember the sounds Shut of up. infomercials <laughs> 
Oh, like the sounds of the sixties or the sounds of the seventies. Hey, remember, remember this, remember how it made you felt. That's how this movie is. Right. Right. I'll even go. If you're old enough to remember this, Hey, is that freedom rock? Turn it up. (laughs) That this is freedom rock. You have to put this in terms that the kids will understand though. Now it's, Hey, this is uh, what now that's what I call music. 250. Right. (laughs) <laughs> right but um if you notice all the bands and all the songs are american bands oh. with the exception of fleetwood mac which was kind of started in the uk but also in the u.s forest Gump soundtrack reached its peak position of number two on the american charts uh, in august of 1994 it stayed there for seven weeks until it was displaced in september by the soundtrack for the lion king um unfortunately also all the Jimi hendrix experience songs were left off as well as only one of the door songs makes the album. They go through a, a period where they play, I think three or four door songs in succession. There's um, at least two Hendrix, all, right? Yeah. And two Hendrix for sure. Hey Joe, mm. um, all along the watchtower. Oh my gosh. It's so good. Whoever, like whoever, I didn't do the research on it, but whoever picked the music, if it was Zemeckis, I think it was pitch perfect. Like the songs that represent the era, especially now as an adult, knowing what year or what decade these songs came out. I mean, these songs put me right into, you know, that knowledge of the decade and it's fantastic. Yeah. And let's not also forget that there was a third album of just Alan Silvestri score. So you could theoretically have, have three discs of music from, Forrest Gump. But the um in addition to the soundtrack, the introduction of Bubba, fucking phenomenal. He played this character so well that do you remember he couldn't get a job after Forrest Gump? Oh, McKelty, uh, w- yeah, Williamson, he had been working since uh he was age 11 or 9 if I'm not mistaken, and most most directors cuz this was his breakout role, most people in the industry thought that's how he looked and talked. But that was actually a prosthetic. That's not his real lip. So um, he's quoted as saying, the industry didn't realize I was wearing a lip device and I was the same guy who had appeared in 11 different TV series. They thought the director had discovered some weird looking guy and put him in front of a camera. And it's a good thing. Uh, He had to go on Letterman. Like if if you remember uh, the David Letterman show, he had to go on and say, you know, this is who I am. But he had a side gig where um he was a contractor and remodeled bathrooms and kitchens like uh like our, our one of my favorite actors uh Han Solo um <laughs> Uh, come on help me out here guys Harrison Ford <laughs> Harrison Ford thank you <laughs> Harrison Ford like he like he remodeled bathrooms and bedrooms for famous actors wow uh, i couldn't help it was bubba's going through his long list of the ways you can cook shrimp I just found myself having an uncontrollable urge for Bahama Breeze's Jamaican uh, coconut shrimp. <laughs> it is possibly the tastiest meal out there. I mean, it, it, whew, it is fantastic. I was so hungry as he rattled off that list. Like I was mm-hmm. seriously like, where can I go at this time of night to go get this food? Or maybe I just have to cook it myself. I didn't, but I wanted to. Yeah. So, Kevin, I know you love the storytelling and all the historical uh, you know, events that Forrest is tied to, but this movie can only take place pre-internet. That's the only time the plot can actually happen because there's no way that people wouldn't have connected the dots that all the things Forrest has done. He was a college football All-American. He was a Medal of Honor recipient and a war hero. He was a successful entrepreneur who he's featured on the cover of Fortune with Lieutenant Dan. He's an international ambassador for the United States playing ping pong in China. Forrest would be a household name. Yet throughout the movie, anyone on TV who's referring to him, they say, oh, you know, the local gardener from Alabama. How does fucking nobody know who Forrest is today? People be like, "Um, yeah, that dude who keeps running back and forth. Yeah, the Alabama All-American who's the Medal of Honor winner, who's also a multimillion dollar company owner and played China. Everyone would know. So it only works pre-internet. I also wonder watching it, and I don't know, Raj, maybe you can offer insight from the novel, but I still question how much of that is true or as big as he makes it or is his under, you know, it's again, it to me, it feels like a tall tale. I'm not saying he didn't do any of it. And clearly he's oh, unfortunate. He's the owner of the business, please. but did he do every single thing the way he said it? I don't know. Kevin, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. A dark take on Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump is only telling you 50% of the truth. <laughs> I'm not his, saying he's a pathological liar. Uh, I'm just... I think he is. He's got a suitcase like Carrot Top. 
Right? Okay. He's pulling, so he planted is, all his stuff. In he's there. he's pulling out the props to support his bullshit. Oh, I right. played ping pong. Here's my paddle. I just happen to have it with me. Oh, yo, here is a cover of Fortune magazine. <laughs> And it's just like one of those magazine yeah. covers that you would get like at uh, at like a sideshow carnival yes. or something like that. His, his shrimp boat on a green really like a hot. Yeah. He had like a Hot Wheels shrimp boat he played with in the right. bathtub. This is the Gen A. <laughs> oh, it turns oh, out I don't want to go down a complete. Yeah, I don't want to explore it. a completely different thing. But seriously, though, it's interesting because tall tales are exactly that. They're stories and they get changed. And it's almost like the telephone game. One person tells it and they add something to it. And so I'm just saying, I don't know if the this census is recollection. We get to play around with these memories, and they're larger than life. And I think they are just that. Now, I'm again, not invalidating them, but I think they maybe are stretched a little bit. Well, while Forrest is in recovery for a bullet shot to his butt talks, he discovers his uncanny ability for ping pong, eventually gaining popularity and rising to celebrity status, later p- playing ping pong competitively against Chinese teams. At an anti-war rally in Washington, D.C., Forrest reunites with Ginny, who has been living a hippie countercultural lifestyle. This I kind of alluded to this earlier, um, but it's always hard to watch this movie because of Jenny. And it's because, you know, Forrest loves her so much. And you know that she cares about Forrest. She has since they were little kids. You know, run, Forrest, run. She continues to say it time and time again. He punches people out. He screws up her life. And she still says, hey, Forrest, come with me. Or, you know, I, like she loves Forrest. She does. And she doesn't know how to handle these emotions because she's been abused and had such a troubled childhood. Um, it's just always so hard because you love Forrest. It's Tom freaking Hanks. You said it before. He's one of the most likable people and he does such a great job playing this character. So I understand it. I understand, especially as an adult, why Jenny may act out in these ways, but it doesn't make it any easier. It's heartbreaking. Uh, and so, you know, especially when you, when you get to the end that we'll get into, it's just like, you know, force has always been there and I believe he would have been with her and married her as soon as they could have. And, and every time she runs away, it's, it's, it's so sad. And and it holds up. I think, uh, I never felt it was uh, forced, you know, forced for emotions. Right. Like yep. I, it felt authentic to me and it's, it's tough to watch. Yeah. I was surprised by the lack of Jenny in the movie going back now. Like she's barely in the movie. I thought she was more, more of a plot device. Obviously, you know, there's certain parts where he's like, I'd always think of Jenny when I'd look at the stars, but I think this really shows looking back now as a a 40 year old, I think it shows a proper examination of an abused woman, someone who's gone through really bad stuff in her life. And, you know, during that era, how she would turn to that countercultural, get involved in drugs. And I don't think the movie panders to the audience to get you to like her. Uh, Okay. Kevin, she does not love Forrest Gump. Forrest is a safe harbor in her crazy life. She has multiple opportunities, two of which while she is sober and in a good place in her life to stay with Forrest, but yet she chooses to pick up and leave. But she, she does not love him only until the end when it's convenient, when she knows she's dying. She doesn't even have the respect to tell this man that she loves, hey, I had your child four years ago. I get what you're saying. And I think that's, I, but I think that's a very surface level observation. And I'm not saying that against you, but I mean, that is what it looks like, right? Okay. So he loves her and he's there and defends her and does all this stuff. And what does she do? She runs away. She tells Forrest to run. That's all she knows. She runs away from her dad for as a little kid. She runs, 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 but she hates herself. She doesn't feel she deserves right. love. And this is an yeah. abused person that it's not that she doesn't love Forrest. It's that she doesn't love herself and she doesn't exactly. deserve Forrest. And I, I agree that's why it's more heartbreaking. And I don't want to jump ahead too much, but like, yeah, if, by the time she finally does accept him, you know, he's rich and he can care for her child and she won't be around. But she also had times earlier where she knew he had money and she still ran away. So I, I don't think it is convenient. I think it's that she hates herself. And that's a very difficult thing because Jenny's so complex. It's, it's heartbreaking that someone could hate themselves that much and not think they deserve love. And I agree that is a common thing that people don't love themselves, but simply because Jenny doesn't love herself means she loves Forrest. That's my only thing. I'm saying it is common for people to be afraid of emotional connection, that her father's abuse had made her this way. But I don't think she has shown me enough when she was in a good place that she cared for Forrest. 
other than those few times that she touched his life? I think there's two parts of the movie and it's ahead of where we are now in the narrative, but just to address it, when she comes back to the farm and she's there, she's like, it's almost like she's recovering. Right. And they dance again and and they go back. But like Kevin said, I agree. After they make love, she realizes she's not good enough. That's why she, you you see, and it's a very quick scene, but you'll notice she gives back the medal of honor. Mm -hmm. She gives back those gifts because she feels he's too good for her and she doesn't deserve it. She needs to go. She needs, I think, I think she's sober now and she goes off for the next four years to hold that sobriety and then calls him. Okay. So I don't want to harp on this anymore. Was Forrest worth a note? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's hard to, it is heartbreaking. <laughs> it, I'm not saying it was good. Yeah. I, she screwed up though. It's, it's very hard because there's certain characters in movies that are bad people. And Jenny does a lot of actions that hurt Forrest. And you want to say like, that's a bad thing to do, but she is messed up. And I, I, I don't think, is. you know, and, and she's trying to do the best she can to pick up her life and pick up the pieces. And I agree with Raj. Like, I think that she would have gotten her act together and gotten together with Forrest and they would have had a life together. And unfortunately it was cut short and it was too late, but I don't think that she ends up, out of convenience. I don't think it was a last resort. I, I don't think, think it she, was either. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think she's ever using him. And I think that she goes away because she needs to prove to herself that she needs to stand on her own. Because if you notice all throughout, like when she's going through troubles, especially in the, in this scene where they meet up again in Washington, DC and uh, you see her boyfriend, fucking Wesley, fuck Wesley. Oh, like there's the a lot of parallels right now that are happening. And today with all the BLM protests. And I think, uh, you know, the, the, um, for social, the social injustices that are happening, all the protests that are happening around the world, there's a lot of parallels between that time and what we're experiencing now. But what I love is that the movie depicts like there are today. Like if you see pictures of the chop or the Chaz or whatever, you know, not that the, those aren't wrong, but you know, inevitably in every, protest they're going to be bad actors they're going to be these fake assholes that pretend to be progressive that are just actual dicks in life like trying to get girls like jenny right yeah exactly and fuck this wesley character like it gave me so much pleasure to watch forrest just throw haymakers at this long-haired smug face wesley oh it was perfect when he hits Jenny and then he comes back the next day because he realizes he screwed up and he's going to lose this girl that's, you know, too good for him. And that, you know, she's got her troubles, but this guy's garbage. And then he says, hey, there was a lot going on. I would never hurt you. Did you want to just punch him? He just hit her. Like, there's no excuse for that. And, you know, when you see them in the future, it, it makes you even more angry that he's been continuing to be abusive. The best part is that people, to prove that we underestimate Forrest, is that he's looking at Jenny smiling and then Jenny gets on the bus and he immediately changes to like his tough face yeah, when, to Wesley. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> Forrest is completely aware of the situation and what's going on. And, you know, he, he, he switches from, from showing support to trying to intimidate him to at least give Jenny a fighting chance. You know what? It's like we talked about in the army because Forrest is so matter of fact and straightforward. He's a great judge of character. You know, like if Forrest Gump doesn't like you, you're a piece of trash because Forrest Gump is a good person. He likes everybody. He likes everybody. Yeah. So if you do something to piss him off, you're in trouble. I did a play in, in high school that oh. centered <laughs> around one? the, 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 like the Forrest's speech. Like it was written by our drama teacher because she kind of lived in, in this time, but it very, it reminded me uh, about this, but that was one of the, um, one of the blowbacks of this. And one of the criticisms of this movie is that it didn't tackle. Like it took the, the coward's way out people claim by the the general or the the officer that pulls the plugs on his speech that he gives there i you know i always took it i thought that was a great comedy beat and i i don't think that they did it because they didn't want to make a statement out of vietnam i mean you could read into it that way i get it but to me i think it's a funny moment it's just that whole you know no one can hear him and then they start cheering for him it's a great comedy beat but i looked it up 
I found out from Tom Hanks. Did you guys see he said what he Mm -hmm. talked about in the scene? Uh, I'll read it right here. According to Tom Hanks, that scene where he's completely quiet in the mic, he says, sometimes when people go to Vietnam, they go home to their mamas without any legs because of Lieutenant Dan, of course. Sometimes they don't go home at all. That's a bad thing. And that's all I got to say about that. I don't know if he would have said that. I mean, yeah, that's a nice sentiment, but would it have been as good as good of the scene as we got? I don't think so. Well, Robert Zemeckis, he struggled with this scene in the research that I did. He actually reached out to people like Robin Williams to write, write something and nothing just fit. So the way they got around it was just unplugging it. And, and which again is a good beat, but I, I think people who don't know that fact may look at this movie as, well, they're not taking a stance one way or the oh. other. Oh, shut up. It's not that- about stances. It just made <laughs> it more mysterious because there's no way that Forrest with whatever he said would have fired up the crowd. You keep it. So at the end, when he gets hugged, yeah, you said it all, man. You said this it all, is, right. this is, this is the, yes. this is the whole, you know, I'm going to tell you the secret of happiness or I'm going to tell you the right. secret to women and it's, and then a bus goes by and they're like, okay. And now you like, it, it's, this, it's just that mysterious Forrest Gump is such a sage with all his experience because he's larger than life and had all these, like he has all this knowledge and I don't think we deserve to know everything that Forrest knows. You know, we're not good enough for Forrest. So I, I like that, that they just left it left it be and uh again it's a nice sentiment but that's a great moment in the movie well returning home forest endorses a company that makes ping pong paddles earning himself twenty five thousand dollars which he uses to buy a shrimping boat fulfilling his promise to bubba his commanding officer from vietnam lieutenant dan joins him and though initially forest has little success after his boat is the only surviving boat in the area after hurricane carmen he begins to pull in huge amounts of shrimp and uses it to buy an entire fleet of shrimp boats Lieutenant Dan invests the money into an Apple computer and Forrest is financially secure for the rest of his life. He returns home to see his mother's last days. So I didn't remember that Forrest was so terrible at shrimping until I watched this again, because we all know Bubba Gump Shrimp Company, like that's a huge thing. And we know that after Bubba's long list, like he's going to go on and be successful. But I forgot how terrible he was and that he lucks into it he's the only boat left and so he becomes great so that's a, that's another great comedy beat number two gary sinise as lieutenant dan is amazing in this role like this is the one that how did he not get the oscar and only because of the competition i mentioned pulp fiction earlier you know i mean he was up against samuel l jackson in pulp fiction uh and i have a feeling not saying that he's not a great actor but martin landau and ed wood which is another great movie but i i feel like it was one of those make good oscars you know how they do that you get passed up for so long right give it to you because again with the competition it's unfortunate because this role is amazing and lieutenant dan is a great character he's so well written he's so funny he has such a big heart as as mad as he is that force saved him because he was supposed to you know quote unquote die with his platoon and die with honor he eventually comes around and you can tell in that new year's scene when he's getting together with the women like even though at that time you still feel like he's mad at Forrest, but they mistreat Forrest and he has his back. He chases them off. He cares about Forrest. And and so you've got this character that's comedic and grumpy, but he also has the heart of gold and he's masterful in this role. So all I can think of as a parallel is Tom Cruise and born on the 4th of July as they portray that, that disabled veteran. What we don't get there is truly the, you know, the happy redemption I don't like the dark Lieutenant Dan as much as the Dan who kind of the clouds clear from the the challenging God in the storm yeah. to I never thanked you for us in the swim. He's in the movie very little, but his impact is is felt throughout the movie. Anyone else, any other actor, Lieutenant Dan's a dick and you don't like him. But Gary Sinise, the way he plays it, yes, he's a hard ass and yes, he can be a dick and abrasive, but he's a lovable one and that's the different like when you get a great actor in a role that's that well written i i think it's amazing that you never hate lieutenant dan as mean as he seems to forest and as grumpy as he is who goes but i hate lieutenant dan you don't right no i think lieutenant dan i tweeted this last night one of the best on-screen characters uh his introduction is memorable big d what's an f and g fucking new guy oh okay oh that's that's great uh but that scene where lieutenant dan pulls him down when they're in the hospital 
And, and like, you can feel like that's heart wrenching. And what's interesting is how Lieutenant Dan's character, you know, you talked about Kevin, how the character of Lieutenant Dan, all of his past, um, his father, his father's father were all, you know, they, he was supposed to die. That was his path. That was his journey. Well, Gary Sinise actually grew up in a family of veterans, and he's been involved with supporting military veterans going back as early as the 70s. Uh, after September 11th, the terrorist attacks, he became more actively involved in supporting the military. He's traveled across the world to visit active duty soldiers, including Iraq and Afghanistan, and has also performed for members of the of the military and their families with his band, the Lieutenant Dan Band, which I think is cool. Yeah. Um, and in 2011, um, you may have you may have seen this on Facebook and stuff. He founded the Gary Sinise Foundation, which is a charity. It's a 503C where it's specifically focused on veteran services that offer a variety of programs and events for wounded veterans of the military. Uh, in 2018, his foundation raised $35 million. And among some of its programs is the construction of specially adapted smart homes for severely wounded veterans that are provided mortgage free, which I think is fucking you, you talk about again, there couldn't have picked a better character for Lieutenant Dan, Gary Sinise. And, uh, you know, I, I will say he is, he's a great person and he's done so much that you've read off the list, Raj. Um, but, uh, I have a house that was built for a wounded officer, two blocks from where I live. Uh, we had a police officer that was shot. He's, you know, he was in pretty bad shape. Uh, officer Mike Flamian, uh, is his name. And, uh, he, yeah, his house is an incredible house that, that Gary Sneese's foundation built for him two blocks away from me. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's incredible what he does for for people and so it, it extends even beyond military to police officers and uh, it's quite the foundation well have you guys ever been to the bubba gump shrimp company though absolutely <laughs> big d have you ever been oh you talking go to, about go, bahama go to, breeze go to bahama breeze Fuck, why <laughs> don't risk it so i I mean, this is something that I didn't really think about because, of course, they turned the Bubba Gump Shrimp Company from the movie into a restaurant and they've got them all over the place. They're tourist attractions. They've got one at Universal Studios Florida, which I'm sure you guys have walked by and have probably been to uh, on the City Walk. Uh, but I can't think of another franchise or business that's been spun off from a movie that's been as successful as this one. The closest thing I could think of is the Wonka candy that Nestle had had licensed and you see people giving out at Halloween. Uh, but yeah. are there any others that have become this big? Like Bubba Gump Shrimp Company is huge. No, it's usually the inverse, right? Like uh, <laughs> we talked about this on Demolition Man where they shoehorn in that all the restaurants in the future are Taco Bells. Oh, right. For product right. placement. But this For product like, placement. That wasn't a thing. And then and then uh, mm-hmm. they came along after the movie was such a success. Uh, I was reading on Wikipedia, which we know is always accurate. But uh, <laughs> Rusty Pelican Restaurants, Inc. approached Paramount and they wanted to create this. And so within a year, they had a concept and they opened these up and they've now got 45 restaurants around the world. And I mean, again, that's since 95 and they're still around. They're still popular. Uh, I just I thought that was really interesting because I can't remember it happening like this other than Forrest Gump. Yeah, you said they're all over the world. They're in the Philippines, Malaysia, but ironically, there isn't one in Alabama where <laughs> Forrest grew up. But do you know who was discovered for working at Bubba Gump? Who's that? While he was working at Bubba Gump was Chris Pratt. He was working no. at the Bubba Gump restaurant in Maui. Yeah. So, um, at the age of 19, he was living in a van and waiting tables, and an actress uh, offered him a role in her short film. So that was how he got his, uh, one, oh of my the, one of the ways he got his big breaks. And like, that's how I thought by working at Planet Hollywood, eventually I would be founded. You well, yeah, know, and, you, and, you got a, you exactly. got a podcast, Raj. I mean, it worked out, right? <laughs> yeah, but he's also got some videos on uh, you porn. The, oh. uh, what was it? The, the casting couch where Raj was tricked <laughs> into some bad situations. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. But listen, everybody always, whenever you, you you regurgitate some of these lines, these famous quotes, people always go to life is like a box of chocolate. But for me, it is not even near the best line in the movie. During this shrimping section, we find out that the Hurricane Carmen has devastated the shrimping industry. And it's on TV. And it immediately from, you know, the only boat to survive was, and you see the Jenny, it's a smash cut to Forrest and Lieutenant Dan cutting open the nets and all the shrimp are falling. And he goes, after that, shrimping was easy. It is <laughs> by far the best line. It was unexpected. I laughed out loud. And it shows you how, like at the end of the movie, not spoiler alert, 
life is a mix of destiny and also what you make and kind of happenstance. Without the hurricane, it wasn't a special skill of Lieutenant Dan or Forrest that led them to be successful. It was their destiny, but also just the happenstance of being the only boat to survive. We talked about how great Sally Field's portrayal is and how she she was kind of robbed, but it did kind of reinvigorate and reignite her career. That scene when he goes back to his mother, who is battling from cancer, especially at home for me, as my mom is again battling cancer for the third time, I think more than anything, when you hear that line and it's it's very easy to throw away and and laugh at, you know, oh, Forrest Gump, life is like a box of chocolate, it's never know what you're going to get. If you really examine that line, it it's deeper than what people think about it, right? The whole purpose of this movie, and again, it's more than the historical elements, it's that you don't know what life is going to throw at you. It could be really good. It could be really bad. It's going to have its ups and its downs. But what really, what I think the lesson that we have to learn here is in the face of overwhelming adversity, you've got to keep going. You've got to have that positive spirit. If you let yourself go into what Jenny goes down, which is a life of despair or drugs or trying to run away from your problems or putting all of yourself, all of your happiness into people that are just going to abuse, like abuse that happiness and just treat you like shit, it's going to be bad for you. And so even though right now I'm, you know, I lost my dad, it's father's day. I lost my dad. Um, This is the second father's day that I'm going out with him. I may lose my mom again. How we react to these situations in our lives is, is really um, is the lesson that we're supposed to learn here from Forrest. And, and, and so I think, especially now looking back at the age of 40 and, and all the things that I've gone through, this is the kind of stuff, this is the kind of scene that really makes this movie so powerful for me. I mean, we got to bring Kevin on more time. So get this emotional side of you. Cause normally you're fucking just goober. And now to, to see the, I don't know if you're really feeling all these things, Raj, but I, I hope this is an awakening. Uh, but for me, I got to tell you the same thing. I I'm, I'm going back and forth as the movie's going. I'm loving certain parts. I'm I'm digging what they're putting down, but at the same point, I'm also not enjoying the heavy handedness of it. And, you know, I'm just about to sour on this movie at this point. And I've thought, okay, this is just the saccharine, sweet, feel good, nostalgic tale of emotional manipulation that this was clearly just Oscar bait. This movie was put out at the time. Tom Hanks, great cast. Let's get the music. Let's get the soundtrack. Let's fucking box it up, package it, ship it out, and let's get some Oscars, right? Then we get Sally Field. And like you said, Roger, this scene of just Tom Hanks and Sally Field sitting in that room with the windows, stationary cam, and and Mrs. Gump is telling Forrest, it's my time, you know, people die it's the it's basically the circle of life i'm dying it's a person that is a destiny. natural thing right it's a natural thing you know and you have to do the best with what god gave you and i found myself emotionally connected to that i don't know if it's because i'm a father but i could not deny the impact of this to say okay there can be a dichotomy in this it can be the the pretty packaged Oscar bait film. That's all good. Yeah. The soundtrack, let's bring up the memories. But at the same point, it has a heart. So the, the heart is the relationship between Forrest and his mother. And at this point it pulls me back and I'm, I'm right back in emotionally. Well, one day Ginny returns to visit Forrest and he proposes marriage to her. She declines though feels obliged to prove her love to him by sleeping with him. She leaves early the next morning and on a whim, Forrest elects to go for a run. Seemingly capriciously, he decides to keep running across the country several times over some three and a half years, becoming famous. Okay, so unfortunately, I just said I'm back in. I'm emotionally tied. The music makes me go back out. Okay, (laughs) the music is now out of control. Not only is it prepackaged soundtrack, but now we get the scenes are spelled out literally in the lyrics and titles of the song in new year's we get to see jenny in la with the doors don't you love her madly the lyrics are don't you love her madly want to be her daddy don't you love her face don't you love her she's walking out the door 
She's laying in bed with another man trying to play daddy like she's done a thousand times before. Yep, we get it. We get it. Jenny's done this a thousand times before. Later, we get Jenny in bed with another guy doing drugs. This time, we get Skinnered Freebird. And the lyrics are, this bird you'll never change. Oh, 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 oh. And the birds you cannot change. And this bird you cannot change. Lord knows I can't change. Lord help me, I can't change. Okay, and yep, we understand it. We see what's going on. Jenny can't change. She's fighting it, right? I'm pushed to my limits when we get Forrest Gump's running montage. That's a running on empty with ja- by Jackson Brown. The lyrics start, I don't know where I'm running now. I'm just running on. We get it. Forrest just got up out of his seat, literally didn't know where he was running and starts running. Okay, so now further on in the montage, we get another running song. Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band, Against the Wind. We were running against the wind, and the years rolled slowly past, and I found myself alone, surrounded by strangers. Wait, Forrest is surrounded by strangers on the road? This this is so amazing. I thought they were friends. I found myself further and further from my home. Wow, Forrest is, looks like he's out in the middle of maybe Wyoming. Who knows? And I guess I lost my way. There were, oh, so many roads I lived to run and run to live. Do they think the audience doesn't understand what the characters are going through, that they need to literally spell out what's going on? So so are you saying you would have much rather have had like an Alan Silvestri score over this? Or you just don't like the song selection because it it, it related to running and you just don't like songs that that have a direct correlation no. with what you're visually seeing on screen? It's like a Randy Newman song. There's Forrest nothing wrong with Randy get Newman. Get out of the chair. Forrest got to run down the street. He's running cross county into the state. It's how, how did you get Randy Newman on to do that Forrest Gump original? That's what I want to know, first of all. But, uh, well, Big D, I get what you're saying. What you're saying is that it's a little bit too on the nose for you. Like, when you watch Guardians of the Galaxy or Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, James Gunn puts in deep cuts. These songs are amazing, and they're not the songs you hear in every other movie. Like, they're very good, and but they do have meaning behind them. These songs... Even though they're good songs, you're saying they're literally spelling out what's happening. My question literally. to you is how? Do, but but how do you separate? How do you guys separate songs that are perfect because they're about what the movie is going through, and deep cuts that are meaningful but don't spell out? You know what I mean? Like that's a hard line to walk. And I don't know. I I would probably. Th- in a lesser movie be a little bit more um, negative about them. I would, I would maybe make the same complaints, but it's such a good movie and such a well-crafted yeah. script that when these songs happen, I'm just like, Oh, these are great songs and they're relevant. So I, I get it. Big D. I get that the lyrics may appear on the nose because as you said, I mean, they are telegraphing what's happening, but in a lesser movie, I'd agree with that. But this movie is so good. The script is so well crafted. The pacing is so good. The character is so likable. It's a great story where I just, I think this soundtrack, as we mentioned before, is phenomenal. And I'm like, yeah, these are great songs and they're relevant. Like, I don't know. It, it never offends me in this case. Yeah, it, it doesn't because it's period specific and they're just great songs. They're fucking phenomenal songs. And they're they're a slice of Americana. And in a movie like this, where it is one big nostalgia trip at times, I don't. I, I agree with Kevin. It doesn't bother me as much because they use fantastic songs. And I also do agree with James Gunn's uh, usage of similar type music. What bothers me is what you two said early on that you hate over exposition. You, if you have to state something in dialogue or on screen or voiceover that you don't convey in the scene itself, you have failed. By doing this, it's overkill. I understand why you're doing it, because it is a great song. And yeah, to see Forrest running against those beautiful backdrops, I just felt you didn't need to do it. There could have been a more emotional impact. And keep in mind that the running portions of the movie by far are my favorite. They are ridiculous, but they're fun at the same point. This is the only accomplishment that Forrest has really done that is, it's accomplishable. A normal person can put their mind to something and overcome a challenge. You can do it. You can't go win a Medal of Honor. You you could, but you most likely would probably die before you did it. You're not going to become an All-American. So that Forrest takes this, this running challenge was very real, very relatable. And I do love the running montage, contrary to what it may seem. This is where I believe Kevin, though, in that it could be a tall tale. 
with him, like uh, the, the bumper sticker and the shirt with the smile. That's where I'm like, mm, is he is he embellishing a little bit here? That's yeah. I mean, come on, you it's you can't physically do what he did. You can't. I don't care. Like you said, someone can put their mind to it, but honestly, there is no way. Forrest, first of all, he would weigh like 80 pounds. He'd be so skinny as a rail from all that cardio if he did that much. Like there's no way Forrest actually did this. Did he run? Yes. Did he make a paper? Yes. People followed him. But was it that many? Did he run for that long? I, I agree. And one more thing though, Big D, lazy exposition and dialogue is one thing and putting things on the screen with text and really spelling it out that's lazy but i don't think music plays by the same rules because not everyone pays attention to the lyrics that closely so you can hear a melody music can make you feel something but i don't like all these lyrics you posted with the actual lyrics of the song i'm only now seeing how on the nose they are and i know these great songs but i never i I wasn't even listening that closely it was more about how they made me feel than being telegraphed. So I don't think necessarily songs always play by the same rules. I, I do have some information that backs up your theory that this is all a, a you know, some wild fish tail. Did you notice the outfits that Forrest's like his chase team were wearing? Yeah. Jeans, fucking some dude was in boots. One looked like a construction worker. There is no way right? those <laughs> dudes are making that run dress like that. Yeah. I wish that I had uh, done like this prep and had this amazing mind blowing revelation to drop because it, no, I did. Well, but I mean, I thought of it, but I didn't do the research and say, "Oh, look at their outfits in this time period." But it'd be interesting to actually do the research and see if you can tell, even maybe by the stuff that he's collected in the briefcase. Is there some clue that like this is just some thing that's related, but he didn't yes. actually, you know? Yes, in in an alternate <laughs> film, we see it from the other people's perspective. Yes. Like Forrest is running and in his mind, it's beautiful. He's like a gazelle. He's on the highway and we see somebody sitting at the diner and it's just this wild man running aimlessly <laughs> down the middle of the street. Uh, I think, I think he, uh, uh, Bob Newhart wakes up and it was just, he lived in a snow globe or something. Well, what's interesting is uh, I've, all, I've often thought about doing these type of life-changing trips and that's why he goes on this. He decides he's going to run across the country four times. He just says, I don't know what I just started doing it. Um, and he tells us it's been three years, two months, 14 days and 16 hours. But have you ever done something like this or, or thought in your head, if I did something like this, I would, I would become a different person. Like you hear people doing the Appalachian trail or the PCT or even Euro trip backpacking alone. Have you ever done something like that? Have I ever done something like that? Yeah. No. <laughs> I wish I could say that I did. I mean, I don't know. I've I guess I've started a website, you know, that's okay. been moderately successful, but yeah. it's been around since 2009. Uh, you Are know, we talking so, about I mean, reviewstl.com. Review yeah, review, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, since you mentioned it. But you know, Review St. Louis, I started in really late 2008 and have been reviewing films, theater. Um, it's been something that I've really enjoyed doing and that's still around and kicking. Um, and then starting a podcast, you know, in 2013, my podcast, Real Spoilers, our first movie was Man of Steel. That was the big superhero movie that kind of got us talking. We wanted to explore it. And now we are, at the time of this recording, 568 episodes, I think, into it seven years later. So that's crazy. You know, to me, I take it for granted. Like, I think to me, I'm a little jaded and I've done this stuff in media and in the industry. And, um, I, it seems normal for me now, but maybe some other people that would be intimidating. Right. But like, I'm not going around saying, Oh my God, I did this and that to me, it's just what I do. But I guess I can kind of say that the media stuff is a little bit along the lines of like, I just did it. You know, I thought I I'm passionate about it. Let me start this stuff and I'm still doing it today. Yeah. I've often thought the only thing I could really do, like I thought, oh, well, maybe I could do the Appalachian Trail, right? But the real hikers that do the Appalachian Trail, they're doing like 20 miles a day of hiking. Yeah. I don't think I could do that. I don't Same have the, the commitment, PCT. I don't think. It, it, would, right. it would be like a life changing. And you're right. It would be for the better for sure. But it's hard, especially with a family. And I mean, to to dedicate that kind of time to better yourself as great as it would be, it, it's it's an intimidating task. I, I think I could do the Euro trip backpacking alone. I think I could do that. Like, is that take, like the trip that and the movie Euro trip they go on? Is that what you're basing this on? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm Scotty talking about like, doesn't know. I'm just talking about like very six, good. Very good. six, <laughs> six Matt, Matt Damon, very good. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> six months with a backpack, traveling across the world by myself, 
you know, with just nothing but my thoughts. You know, Forrest does this for three oh, years. My, who the fuck are you? You don't think <laughs> I could do my this? Thoughts? Just with oh, my thoughts. Kevin, Kevin, this is not Roger Rope. I am bringing out the best, and this is the uh, the Kevin yeah. and Roger experience. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, this is a we. Roger and I used to do a podcast on yeah, Mr. Robot. I don't spoilers. know. If you, so you know, if, we. If, if he was in the same room as you, he'd ruin your bathrobe. <laughs> I think I've brought, I've tapped into something that was missing since our Mr. Robot podcast. Right, I don't know. Exactly. I'm just saying. <laughs> but you talk about like how um, this is almost a metaphor for the entire movie. Him running. Yeah, you know, it's I never realized the dichotomy of the uh relationship and the running between Forrest and Jenny. They're both the entire movie running and it's from the moment that they're kids and Forrest gets on the school bus with his leg braces and there's the bullies chasing him and Jenny says run Forrest run. Not only is she literally telling him to run, but I think I mentioned it earlier, Jenny is running away, trying to run away from her problems and she's never able to run far enough away from them. You know, she's not she's not handling them the right way right you can't run from your problems you have to address them and i'm not ex- i'm not saying that she wasn't troubled and that i'm not calling her bad for doing it she was she was troubled but she was running away which was not the right solution and so forrest physically runs he runs from bullies he runs and carries people out in the war he runs to find his thoughts for three and a half years and all this uh where jenny is running from her problems and every time she thinks she doesn't deserve to be happy she runs away after they make love uh you know when she knows that forrest has money and and he could take care of her she still runs away because she's not good enough um only when she stops running does you know, does their relationship happen and are they able to be happy for even the small amount of time they have? So it's an interesting exploration of running the physical sense and the, you know, the metaphorical sense and the uh, psychological sense. And, uh, but they both run the entire movie. Well, it's, it's not, it's also, you talk about how when when Ginny is running, it's not until when Forrest stop stops running as well, that he and Ginny get back together. That's I a think great this point. He does, yeah. When, when Pretty he soon has after that, a, yeah, that Jesus-like moment. Yeah, you're right. He does. You're right. She stops running from her problems, and she gets her act together. Uh, and Forrest physically stops running because it's not getting him anywhere. It, it, you know, he cleared his mind. He did what he had to do. But at the end of the day, he didn't know why he was running, and it wasn't accomplishing anything except for you know he did give people hope, which was great, but it wasn't doing anything for Forrest. Right. Well, in present day, Forrest reveals that he is waiting at the bus stop because he received a letter from Jenny who, having seen him run on television, asks him to visit her. Once he is reunited with Jenny, Forrest discovers that she has a young son of whom Forrest is the father. Jenny tells Forrest that she is suffering from a virus and together the three back move back to Greenbow, Alabama. Jenny and Forrest finally marry. And the wedding is attended by Lieutenant Dan, who now has prosthetic legs and a fiance. Jenny dies soon afterwards, and the film ends with Forrest and his son waiting for the school bus on little Forrest's first day of school. Opening the book, his son is taking to school. The white feather from the beginning of the movie is seen to fall from the pages. And as the bus pulls away, the white feather is caught on a breeze and drifts skyward. End movie. So... I actually started to tear up at this part in the movie. And whether it's I'm a father now, uh, when Forrest realizes that he is a father, he becomes emotional. He steps back. We're assuming quickly that it's because he's just found out that he's a father, but it's not. He's afraid that little Forrest will also be slow, that he has somehow cursed him with that. And Jenny says, no, 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 he's very smart. And the relief on his on his face, and he goes and sits down next to Forrest. This scene and these performances at the end of the movie were like a big bow on it, and it tied up this fun ride, even though I had problems with it, with an emotionally rewarding moment that it made everything else kind of disappear. And and I felt what the movie was trying to was trying to do. I agree. I mean, there are definitely some emotional moments in this film, the scenes with the mother, interactions with Jenny, all the stuff we mentioned before. But I think this is the most impactful. And I also think it's because you've been on this journey. I I think that uh, his story, you've gotten to know for us. This movie is like two hours and 20 minutes. But to me, it's it's a tight two hours and 20 minutes. It's well paced. It's so well written. And we've gotten to know Forrest and we care about him. And 
the the moment he realizes he's a dad, it's that gut punch. And then also, like Big D said, for the reason that he's worried about his son having the same trials and tribulations. Um, it's it's a it's a great, great moment. And then you're also tying together the discovery of him being a father and then also very shortly thereafter he's going to lose jenny the woman he's loved and has chased after this entire movie the, the, he finally gets together with her and he doesn't hardly get to enjoy it at all it's it's heartbreaking it's you for these both of these people it's a it's a tremendous journey and that scene at the grave site i don't know if i'm jumping oh. too far but i mean again you know not too long after the discovery as a child when jenny does pass away and he's at the grave talking to her and telling and explaining to her about uh he'll take care of uh their son and anything you need just let me know it is amazing and and tom hanks absolutely deserves the accolades for this performance i didn't even realize that Haley joel osment was little forrest or forrest jr this is like a sixth sense revelation right like <laughs> right. like it was that it was it was uh shocking I, I you know I didn't know who he was back when I saw this movie the first time and uh yeah I it, it, he was tiny in this movie but still recognizable like he looks the exact same today that face it's a recognizable face he's on it if is. you haven't watched it uh, what we do in the shadows he's on an episode of that oh, this season he? it's oh. he's great he plays a um he plays a familiar okay it, th- that's in the house and then um he ends up <laughs> ends up becoming a zombie it's just great if you're not watching what we do in the shadows if you haven't seen the movie or the fx series you're, you're missing out but um big d messaged me last night and he's like hey uh find out for me how did how did jenny die what was the how you know why did she die and it was rumored for a long time that possibly because of all the sex she was having unprotected possibly in the 70s uh, and it, be, it being the early 80s could be HIV. It could be AIDS, but it's uh, it's not specified in the film. But in the sequel book, Gump and Company, the author reveals that Jenny dies from hepatitis C uh, from contracting that in the early 70s from her drug abuse. And I didn't know this about hepatitis C. It was an unknown disease until 1989. And we know wow. that hep C, um, if you share needles. Uh, that that's a that's a very easy way to contract hepatitis C. So I think it's actually less AIDS and more Hep C. Yeah, I always I always thought she. I mean, they don't say it, but I always thought she died from AIDS. That's interesting. There's actually an explanation in, in the book now. Whether or not the movie follows that logic is, I mean, there's no necessary connection there. But that's interesting that the author, the creator, has put that out there. So yeah, yeah. And, you know, again, Big D, you talk about that saccharine sweet feel. A lot of people are all, you know, they, they in the same vein as people shit on the plastic bag and American Beauty, people have always started to shit on the, the feather. But uh, the feather really has a lot of symbolism in this movie. Number one, obviously, it opened and closes with the image of that, you know, floating through the air. In the beginning, it comes to rest on Forrest's suitcase. In the end, it flies back into the air. I think this is in a very effective job. Again, if you're a visual storyteller, how it helps to symbolize the cycle that has now been completed, specifically the cycle of life and death and of new beginnings. Um, and also in Native American culture, it's believed that all things possess an inherent virtue, power, and wisdom. The feather, for example, is a powerful symbol that signifies honor and a connection between the owner, the creator, and the bird from which the feather came that symbolizes trust honor, strength, wisdom, power, and freedom. And it's an object that is deeply revered and a high sign of honor. And when a feather falls down to the earth, it's believed to carry all of the bird's energy. And it is perceived as a gift from the sky, the sea, and the trees. And if you remember, Jenny and Forrest prayed for God to make her a bird so they could fly far, far away. So I love now, you know, doing a dumb little movie podcast, listening to movies like you guys do at real spoilers and, and doing a little bit of, you know, homework and research on this. I can appreciate this a lot more than I could. Um, and for those who think that this is just, you know, it's dumb. It's like the plastic bag. I, I love the imagery of the feather now, which that's uh, a great connection cool. with the, 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 I want to, you know, let's pray and I want to be a bird and fly away. That's an amazing connection that I've yeah. never even connected it that way. I just figured it was I the, the whole coming and going and doing its job and a nice bookend, but that's, that's deep. I like it, Raj. Thanks. No, guys. but, I mean, but I mean, they, it's again, they do it twice when Forrest is at her gravesite 
And he's talking to her and he's saying, you know, whether or not I'm going to go to God, whether I'll see you again. He's startled by the birds in the trees that then fly mm-hmm. into the sky. And he's reassured by that, that Jenny is in heaven. So this is a, a something they go to a few times. But Roger, I also did some research here and I was going to try to provide some information. Some, so people leave the podcast with a little tidbit of knowledge they could share with their friends. How rich is Forrest Gump? That's the question. We don't know. Well, he's a it's gazillionaire, dollars, right? Yeah. It, it, th- this is in <laughs> in the dollars of the day. So I'm going to break okay. it down for you. So Forrest doesn't make a majority of his money from the shrimping. That is only a tiny fraction. They get a letter from Apple, and Lieutenant Dan had told Forrest that he had invested in some kind of fruit company. It was actually Apple. So at the time of the movie, we're hearing this and we're seeing the letter. It is after Hurricane Carmen had hit. That was 74. And at this time period, Apple Computers was in the very early days. They were starting to go out for venture capital. Apple actually received a $250,000 investment from Mike uh, Marcula in 1976. So this angel investor eventually became the second CEO of Apple. After that round, there was a second round of venture capital where they raised $500,000 for 15%. So keeping in sync with the timeline of the film, we can assume that Forrest Gump took part in this round of financing. They bought a $100,000 stake, which would have been good for 3% of Apple. Apple stock then began trading for the first time on the public market, December 12, 1980. Uh, the launch consisted of selling 4.6 million shares at $22 a piece. So by the end of trading that day, the Apple stock closed at $29 which uh, was still really well for a a young company like Apple, but at $1.78 billion, owning 3% of Apple, by the end of that day, Gump would have been worth $53 million, cut half of it to give to Bubba's mom, the church, the hospital, whatever. So somewhere around that $28 million is the answer. Wow. Ah, Nice. I still like Kevin's answer. Uh, Gazillionaire? He's a gazillionaire. I mean, he comes out and tells you he lo- he mows the lawn for free. What do you got? You know, that's right. Now it's time for the podcast. We're breaking our chat meters and give you our wipe scores. If you've never listened to the podcast before, zero wipes is absolutely perfect. Five wipes is terrible. We'll start with you, Kevin. You're our guest here. How many wipes do you give Forrest Gump? Well, thank you guys. Uh, this movie, in my opinion, is just about as close to perfect as you can get. It is a tight screenplay well paced well acted it 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 runs the gamut of emotions it's funny it it makes you cry it makes you laugh it makes you it, you just you love the character development of forrest by the end of the movie with the combination of tom hanks and the character of forrest how do you not love this guy it's a great experience it's a, a, what you want to feel when you go to see a movie so i'm going to say 0.5 wipes wow all right big d do you agree Oh, uh, surprisingly, pl- pretty close. As much as I've had bad things to say throughout the 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 review tonight, uh, I I do love the film. I still feel the same way I did, or very close to when I first saw it. It is syrupy. It's nonsensical at times. It one hundred percent was Oscar bait. I think the sentimentality is over the top, but there is no denying the effectiveness of Hanks as the central performance. Like most of Tom Hanks' characters, his heart is in the right place throughout, and he has only the best intentions for those around him. Forrest is a man of few words that would be laughable today, but Tom Hanks manages to make this character relatable. He's an everyman, even though his his exceptional achievements are anything but ordinary. Uh, It was a success then. I do not think it was the best movie of 1994. That is Pulp Fiction by far, but they did enough in here. To remind me, like you said, Kevin, this is why I go to the movies. At the end of this viewing, I hit stop and I felt better about myself. I Mm -hmm. felt better about life. I was happy. Today, driving my car, I put on the soundtrack and I ran through the music and I was thinking about the the, all the different scenes. Uh, Is it perfect? No, I can see the puppet strings, but it is pretty pretty close i think it is a 0.75 wipe movie and and that is yes it is a popcorn summer budget but it is the best of that bunch so 0.75 wow 
I guys, I agree with, with both of you. Um, I'm a little bit more on the Kevin side. It's almost a perfect film. The movie holds the number 12 position on IMDb's top 250 movie chart. But as I said earlier, many critics either love this movie or really hated it. Uh, in his 1994 review, Roger Ebert gave Forrest Gump four stars and called it a magical movie, whereas Entertainment Weekly gave it a C rating and said it reduced the tumult of the last few decades to a virtual reality theme park, a baby boomer version of Disney's America. But as I said before, this movie isn't about historical events. It's about resilience in the face of adversity and how we respond to what we're given. Plus, as both of you mentioned, Tom Hanks is fucking great, but, but it's not Tom Hanks that makes this movie. I tweeted this out. Tom Hanks is great in this movie, but the supporting cast, uh, McKelty Williams, Sally Fields, Gary Sinise, Robin Wright, they really are the ones without a supporting cast. This movie would have been not as powerful as it is. The directing is amazing. The soundtrack is top notch. I did feel better. I was happier. The pacing is great. It, every scene is tight. There's a reason for it. It flies by even at two hours and 22 minutes. For me, it's as it's as close as we can get to perfect. Um, the John Lennon scene is a little shoehorned. So it's a quarter wipe for me. So it's, it's 0.25. So 0.25, 0.75, and a half a wipe. The, you take that divide by three. That gives you our overall chat ranking, which is what big D. Uh, so that comes out to an average chat score of 0.5 wipes. So that ties it in the 12 spot with aliens and princess bride. It is slightly better and slightly, slightly better than Edward Scissorhands, the shining and die hard. And it is slightly worse than predator fight club and saving Private Ryan. We ranked predator that high predator. Dude. Predator's I mean, Predator's fucking, good. Yes. Dude. Remember, we you can't you, you can't compare all the fruit. You compare apples to apples, oranges right. to oranges. They're very different movie. Predator is almost perfect for what it is. You're right. You're right. You're Forrest right. Gump is also is 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 nearly perfect for what it is. And Kevin, I want to I want to just put out you know a, an olive branch to you. If you want to sit down and do a rewrite of the dark R rated version of Forrest Gump <laughs> that tells the tale of some, some psychopath, dim witted Southern, you know, whatever Dude, it read is. The that, book. Read the book. <laughs> Just, I, you don't have to rewrite it. It's already written. I'm picturing the book sounds like of mice and men. Lenny. It is. That, it's, it's like a Lenny. violent forest that's out there abducting people. He's killing anyone who intimidates Jenny. Uh, he's running around the streets wild, imagining he's running coast to coast. This could be, the sleeper hit of 2021. Is Shat looking for a spec script? Are you going to produce? Uh... <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> We're going to do a treatment. All right. I, Raj, real quick, I wanted to tell you, based on what you said in your uh, rating, you know, this movie, not only, as you mentioned before, with the box office and how long it stayed around in theaters and how it makes people feel happy, and we all said we felt better after watching it, but as a testament to that, this movie in its 977th week on DVD release, do you want to guess, each of you, how many copies did this movie sell in the past week? Raj? What, the last um, week now? Like, the, yes. like today? Most yes. recently. How many DVDs did this sell last week, Raj? Uh, uh, 1,500. Okay, Big D? I'm shocked that people are still buying DVDs. <laughs> I know. That somebody <laughs> bought uh, 50,000. This movie in the week of May 17th, 2020, sold 13,757 wow. copies. You're talking about a DVD that's been out for 977 weeks in the age of streaming. That is how much people love Forrest Gump. It has now sold 1.135 million DVDs. Uh, they spent 100000 last week, $100,000. It has made $10.5 million just on DVD alone. I mean, it's phenomenal, the impact this has had and that people love it. I mean, that's not mentioning Blu-rays that have made a few million. Um, yeah. You know, this movie is a movie that people love, and I think... As we mentioned, people want to feel good, and this is a movie that makes them feel that way, and it's it's just a joy to watch. Where's Forrest Gump the video game? I think that's, <laughs> that's something they missed out on. Sega it's Genesis. Like Roy. It's, it's like Roy from uh, from Rick and Morty. <laughs> a life well lived. Yeah. Play Forrest. 
Uh, so we, uh, in the, in lieu of doing shout outs. So we used to do shout outs, which, uh, Kevin, you remember that, uh, we would sure. read when people would go to our website and write something down. So we stopped doing that. Uh, we instead said that we were going to take the top reviews of the week that people post on our iTunes, uh, and, uh, and do that. So big D, do you have a review of the week? I do Roger. This week's review comes from iTunes and a listener named red ghost and red ghost said two stars gross. Tell Roger to stop talking about his penis. <laughs> I I don't think you talked about your penis other than us t- t- you know, teasing you about your STD. Yeah, I don't talk about my penis. Also, I think people also got me mistaken for another host on this podcast uh, a lot. So Ashley? I don't know why. Yeah, Ashley, that's the one. <laughs> so I definitely do not talk about my prowess in bed if I ever talk about it or talk about my my penis. So. Thanks for the two stars, though. Thanks for listening. Appreciate <laughs> it. Big D, what movie are we doing next? Okay, next week, we got a commission again from Nelson. And the movie's tagline is, all he needed was a lucky break. Then one day she moved in. High school wrestler Loudon Swain feels he must do something significant in his life shortly after turning 18. Despite vehement advice against it from his father and coach, Swain decides to try to lose 20 pounds in a very short period of time in an attempt to take on the defending state champion of a lower weight class. Meanwhile, he falls for an edgy older Carla who provides further distraction for the young wrestler. This again was commissioned by Nelson, came out in 1985, uh, featured some great songs by Madonna, by Journey. Uh, it made $13 million at the box office. And if you're wearing a, a unitard right now or you're oiled up and you're you're just ready to go to the mat. You're going to know what it is. Uh, and we're looking forward to this one. Yeah, we had a we had a very special guest star from uh, from AEW, a uh, professional wrestler that Big D and I played softball with and have j- followed his own quest, if you will, uh, his own journey. So uh, he joins us for this pod for that podcast. So make sure you tune into that. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Um, but we also want to thank uh, Kevin, man, the Tom Hanks of the podcast world for joining us. <laughs> Uh, I, we really I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Don't be a stranger. Yo, you're um, the only one who's ever called me that, Roger. But thank you for that title. <laughs> <laughs> you really are, though. Like I have, I um, not only are you like the nice one on real spoilers, but everyone on Twitter like has just nothing but great things to say about you, and and I just think it's it's this very special. You're like the big D of our podcast. I thought you were going to say he's the Forrest Gump of their podcast. It's impossible for anybody to dislike him, right? I, you know, I try to spread positivity. I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't ever get all hippy dippy or anything. But honestly, I, I don't try to say that many negative things. You know, there's enough negativity in the world. So I love movies. Try to have fun. Try to have fun talking about them. Uh, if you listen to real spoilers recently, uh, I think Roger mentioned it earlier, but because of the quarantine, there haven't been a lot of theatrical releases, as in no theatrical releases. So we've gone back and done a lot of fun specialty episodes. And right now we're on a kick of misbegotten sequels. So sequels to a movie that is great and then question mark, why did they make this sequel? Some of them have actually been surprised surprising some have been pretty good and then yeah some of them have been more than questionable so you can go listen to that series it's a lot of fun but uh, we're having to get creative with what we choose so i can't always be positive with those movies but at least we have a fun time uh you know we've got a nice dynamic and and it's always a blast so listen to that subscribe to the podcast uh you know on social media we're at real spoilers facebook.com slash real spoilers you know itunes stitcher wherever podcasts are you can find us uh and if you want to follow me on twitter it's at kevin r bracket bracket with two t's and that's R E E L, like a real of yes, movie, not R E L. Right, very clever, right? <laughs> it's very good. I really like it. And uh, we just did Grease two here. If you if, if you want to hear Kevin and the real spoiler boys take on Grease two, uh, there's that that was released a, a few weeks ago. Um, and I was really surprised that your Batman Returns because I I had a very similar. I don't want to spoil it even though that's the name of the podcast, but uh, I really loved your breakdown that of that. And also a plug for your Rosemary baby 
um, podcasts. I thought those were really, really good as well. Thank you, sir. So, yeah. So you can go back the last seven years, pretty much every big new release of the week we've tackled. It's called Real Spoilers. We spoil the crap out of it. We don't hold back. So maybe watch the movie first, or if you don't care, sometimes we can save you some money uh, so you don't have to see it. And then if you want to see some classics or l- hear some classics, uh, The Blues Brothers, Rosemary's Baby, um, uh, uh, Butch and Sundance, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Uh, so we're going through some classics. It's a it's a different spin on what we usually do, but we're having fun with it. Yeah. Well, again, thank you, Josh R, for commissioning Forrest Gump. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We are at Shat the Movies on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram. Our email, if you have any thoughts on our review today or any of our past reviews, you can email us hosts at shatthemovies.com. You can also call into our voicemail number 914-719-SHAT. You can support the podcast a uh, multitude of ways by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, completing a free anonymous survey so we can sell it to advertisers. You can buy our merchandise or you can commission your very own movie. Find all the information by visiting our website, shatthemovies.com. You can also check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review television series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, and Watchmen. Find all the information on that website, shatontv.com, where everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Be sure to subscribe, and if you stop by iTunes, please be sure to leave a five-star review that does help the podcast grow. You can also check out our Twitch channel, where we do live content each week. Every Tuesday, I do uh, the best headlines from my home state of Florida. It's called the Untitled Florida Man Project with uh, two new hosts, uh, Ben and Mr. C. So be sure to check that out on Tuesdays at 8 p.m. live or the replays on YouTube. On behalf of my co-host, Big D, Dick Hebert, and Kevin Brackett, I'm Roger Rover. Be sure to join us next week for the following movie review. Thank you so much for listening. Take care. Good night and good luck. At first, all Loudon Swain could think of was getting in shape. But since he met the girl of his dream... Hands. Really big hands. And he certainly can't do what's on his mind. You know that sexual intercourse burns up 200 calories a shot? By the way. But give the guy a break. When you're in love, you can do some... That being said, Big D, uh, we are we are packed through with commissions. We, people have uh, even through the quarantine, they've taken their their Trump bucks and they're sending in uh, money for us. What? I can't say that. It's quarantine money. Trump bucks, you bastard! It's <laughs> That's Trump what they call it. I, I we I don't call it that. What do you want? To, what should I call well, that? That that money is supposed to last you at least a couple of years, right? That's a whole yeah. twelve hundred bucks. That's that's one to two years yeah. of of expenses. Oh, I can't call it Obamacare. Your stim your stimulus money. Jeez. <laughs> oh, uh, Big D, we are still packed with commissions. People are are taking have taken their stimulus money here in the states and have sent us <laughs> yes their their oh, Trump their, bucks. Yeah, you motherfucker. <laughs> See, I, I'm, we're going to record long enough so it makes his life okay. difficult. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs>